<laughs> well, um, I am here to give a report, or to give a speech more or less, uh, about the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, now, first off, I want you to forget where you are for a few minutes for me. Forget that you're in this school, forget even that you're in this state, and uh, think yourself a soldier. Just, just try it. Uh, you're, you're out in the summer heat, you're in full uniforms like these, um, and you're campaigning for days on end. You've marched about 100 miles in five days, uh, 20 miles a day about. You stop every hour or so to get a drink of water, then you march on through the dust. Uh, anyways, you are a private, and you don't have much to do besides take orders. Uh, these people, they don't have any say in what goes on. They are pretty much expendable, but uh, they are the core of the army. They, they are the life of the army, and they will do whatever the commander said. Now, in Gettysburg, uh, we have a build-up to Gettysburg. The cavalry of the Confederacy was the eyes and ears of the army, and that was their job. Now, a couple months prior to Gettysburg, they had gone off on the road. They had just lost side of the, the army altogether. They uh, actually, they did wind up in an engagement with the Union Cavalry at Brandy Station. That was about May 30th. Today? Well, this week. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they get in an engagement. Uh, about 2,000 cavalrymen flash on this huge, dusty field. And uh, you get what would resemble this, which I think. And uh, the Confederacy loses. They instigated this fight, they lost. So they uh, they ran up into Pennsylvania, way up in Pennsylvania to redeem themselves, because they didn't want to you know, share this loss with the, the rest of the army. And the army, by this time, is totally blind. They don't know what's going on. Confederate army. Anyways, they start their trek up into Pennsylvania that same month. Uh, they spend all June doing it. Uh, the Union army is close behind, I'd say about four days behind. And they are trekking just as hard as the Confederates were. Finally, uh, General Lee, who's the Confederate leader, he finds himself north of Gettysburg. And he knows that the Union is coming up behind. He doesn't know how close. He hears from the scout that they're only two hours behind him. And that was very, very close. <clears throat> so what he did was he instantly turned his army around and he converged on this town of Gettysburg. Uh, now, beforehand, um, the army had been tired, they were without food, and one thing that I had mentioned before during my first report was that they had no shoes. The men had, their shoes were worn away. So uh, a little Confederate scout party comes into Gettysburg. Do you want to play this from They come into Gettysburg from the north. South comes in from the north. They're up in Pennsylvania. You get a the Confederate line coming in, Gettysburg, in search of shoes, of all things. Well, uh, this same day, the uh, Union cavalry, they had noticed them there. They didn't like that. <laughs> you know, if they, they see Confederates, there's a couple thousand cavalry and there's one Union one company, I'd say about 100 men, the Confederates, and of course they're not going to run away. They have the manpower to flush them. So what they do was, the uh, Union Cavalry puts a line right about here. And uh, the Confederates once again instigate a fight. About 100 Confederates against 2,000 cavalrymen. Doesn't last long. Uh, <laughs> Confederates pull back instantaneously and call up support. Lee had no intentions of this battle starting. Uh, he did not want them to be on an offensive right here, right at this point. Uh, but his men couldn't hold back because his brigadier generals just said, go for it. So what they did was, <clears throat> they pulled in thousands more troops right here, reinforced this one here, part of this one right here. So they get one sort of like that against all those Confederate uh, cavalry. And the cavalry have about 2,000 men. I'd say there's about 10,000 Confederates now. <laughs> yeah. My big brother. 
but uh, they do have one little trick up their sleeve. Confederates carry what are called carbines. They uh, can fire about seven shots, as the infantryman can only fire one. And it loads at the breech, so it's a lot easier to load. You break it in half, like a shotgun. You load the bullets in there, pop it up, fire. They uh, pull off the 10,000 Confederates for about two hours. Um, meanwhile, the Union gets up support from John Reynolds, who is a uh, renowned general, uh, Brigadier General Corps commander. And uh, he not only backs up the Union line, he has so many men that the cavalry can just retire by this time. So the cavalry gets out of here, and the, uh, this has now made the Union infantry line, and they are well, well backed up. Well, uh, Lee, by this time, is distraught. He did not want this to happen, but since it has happened, there is no way to pull back. Here are thousands. March in, come here, and they, the Union, are pushed right through Gettysburg, and they fall back to this line here. And they reform overnight fall, and what is important right here, I'll show you one thing. By that time, that line is broken. Confederates are surrounding the town, and they make a new base right along this ridge here, right parallel to that even line. There's a major mistake right here. A man by the name of uh, Ewell, Confederate General Ewell, had this man right here before this line was ever made. He decided, against the will of others, not to take the hill, which was an idiot action. It allowed uh, over the nightfall, thousands more reinforcements came in. Made this line stretch all the way down here, backed up this one, and surrounded this hill. They were entrenched. They were behind rocks. They were behind trees. They were attacked. <laughs> they had no problems. Um, OK, that was the first day. That was July 1st. The second day, it starts in the morning. Ewell has to redeem his actions. He's, he attacks this side. He attacks the flank. He is pushed out of there like he's nothing. He's like he's a rack. So uh, he, he is distraught here, and, and Lee just doesn't know what to do with him. Uh, Lee orders the march. From this point here, <coughs> around about here, to go around the Union line. Well, that doesn't work because there are some guys with binoculars right here. They see his every move, and he notices that. So what he has to do, which takes about five hours to do, is back up here, and all the way back down, back down around the seminary ridge, around the mountain, so they can't see him. Uh, this is where I think you start falling apart. <coughs> there is a man by the name of Sickles. He in general, he extends his line. Is that right? <laughs> Anyways, um, he extends his line too thin. He has about one man every uh, 20 feet. And that's nothing compared to the oncoming Confederates. Well, Confederates get right about here, and he starts falling back. He starts falling. He gets his man and gets out of there. Anyways, this is the same. Okay, you can finish from this one to this one. He uh, gets right out here, and he sees these Confederates. He doesn't know what to do. So, uh, instantly, some uh, signal flew up on, on Little Round Top. They have represented him against the Confederate Heavens twice. And the signal floor officer orders uh, about five regiments up there immediately, or they're going to lose. Out. So, yeah, a bunch of regiments right up here, and one, this is very important right here, 20th May, they must hold the Union flank. They have guys, uh, where are they looking like that? From right now. And, uh, they're going to not to move, not to move under any circumstance. And whether they have five guys that cannot move before the line will class, resulting in Confederates getting around the Union side, coming up from behind, smashing them from front and behind. End of war. Period. So, he does. 
yeah, converts with a line right down here. And the 15th Alabama comes right up by the 20th on their flight, right up on it. Nobody expected it. But uh, Chamberlain, the leader of the 20th Maine, his name is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, a very important figure. Uh, and so I'm here, actually. I'll tell you about later. <laughs> he, uh, he knows what would happen if it's not good. He looks exactly what would happen. All soldiers know that if they lost their line, they would lose the war. Because this place was so far north, this was the whole Union Army of the North. If all they had to do was get around that line, get the Federal Union to be we would now be living in the Confederate States of America. But, uh, you know, this, uh, this smart fellow, he's a, he's a college professor. He studied Roman tactics in the school and rhetoric. Uh, he, he knew what he had to do. Um, the Confederates tried attacking about five times. Five times they were repulsed. Each time. But the last time, the sixth time he came up, the uh, 20th employees were out of bullets. They didn't know. And they, were, they didn't have any more bullets. No more ammunition, no nothing. So, this spell the chamber. He uh, orders a bayonet charge. And this is very brave, considering how close the Alabamians were and how many of them were. He uh, not only orders a charge, you see, you see this line here? This line stays just like it is. This line comes down like this. It shuts them off. Shuts them off until they're right about here. Like a, like a door. Think of a door. A swinging door. Just pushes them right off the mountain, and the other side comes down, collapses right on the ground. And about an hour later, the mountain was secure, the line was secure. Lee was down with his mom. He was furious. Uh, Okay, that's the second thing. And again, fuel attacks at night. Um, now the third day is very important. I'm sure you've all heard of Picket Starch. I don't know. Okay, just making sure. Um, what this was, was the lead ordered the frontal assault of about 12,000 men or so across a big field here to slam right into the uh, units front. What's that going to do now? I mean, that does nothing. You slam into another front, and these guys are entrenched. You can't do anything. General Longstreet, one of uh, Lee's advisors, argues the whole time. He, he has argued about the whole war. He's argued about the whole thing here. He knew it was going to fail. He saw it before they ever conceived it. Well, uh, Long, uh, Lee won't listen to me. He just refuses. And his men, they don't know. You know, the privates like, like me, they wouldn't know anything. Uh, they just, they're just following what Lee says because in their mind he is equivalent to God. He is leading them and they will follow him. Right? Well, uh, Longstreet, under the penalty of law, has to follow Lee's orders no matter what. So he orders one of his generals to pick it. So one of his men, right along here, I don't send their ears. But before he does that, he lines up a cannon. He's got a cannon line from about here to here, a mile of line. Cannons, just full on cannons. It ended up to be the biggest cannonade in U.S. history. It was uh, about an hour long. They shelled right down here, right to the middle here. That's, that's the big area where they're going. Because they had to weaken that line to be able to push their troops. Well, about an hour into it, the uh, cannon commander says, Longstreet, you have to start the, you have to start the battle or I can't back you up. And Longstreet is so against it, he just he doesn't know what to do. So he tells Pickett to, he doesn't even say anything, he just says, just throws his hand. He throws his hand. He doesn't want to say it because it will be on his conscience for the rest of his life. He knows it's going to happen. So Pickett comes up his hand right here. And they, about the same length as the cannon, Kennedy, march out in the field, a mile long, just a mile long of men. Can you imagine? I mean, just looking on either side of you, seeing men for long. Once they come out of the woods, they are under fire from every gun on the field. Every artillery piece in the woods, every cannon. 
Every cannon's not here, they're firing down there. Every cannon's down there, they're all firing. And they are about half strength when they get to right here. And uh, most of them don't even move the wall. They don't make this, this road right now. They're, they're going by the time they get down. One unit did, however, manage to climb a stone wall right about there. And as soon as they did, about every minute was shot. They just, they didn't have, they didn't have the strength. And we lost about 13,000 men that may have uh, And the battle was, you know, the plea was, it was so, it was just not, he had to get out of there. Long Street was in tears that day. And uh, as soon as the battle was over, um, General Pickett approaches Lee. And uh, Lee looks down from him, not down to him on his horse, and he says, General Pickett, you must form your division behind the hill. And Pickett turns to him, looks right dead in the eye, says, General Lee, I have no division. And right there, Lee knew what he did. And he had been blind to it the whole time. That is why the South Las Gettysburg, they would not, Lee would not tolerate listening to others. He would not have, he would not have none advice other than his own. The first day, or the second day rather, he could have easily gone around this big hill here and smashed him from behind. They didn't have anything in that hill. But no, he didn't, he didn't do that. He would not listen. And in return, we pulled out with a trail of Devon wounded 27 miles long. Can you imagine? There are said to be 50,000 men died in three days just in this, in this battle. <coughs> Now what I want you to think is, uh, what would have happened had not Lee made those mistakes? Is it our benefit? Or was it, uh, you know, did you want to be in the South, uh, the Confederacy? I don't think that would have been a very promising life. I think that we should be thankful for every man that gave his life then, Confederate or Union. Had not the uh, battle taken place and had not the it taken place just the way it did, we would now be living in the Confederate States of America. That is just the very truth of it. Because if we had broken this line, he would have gotten to Washington, he would have smashed Washington. He would have had, uh, Lincoln would have had to sign a document, a treaty, and not really have it. So, do you think that the 50,000 men that perished died in vain, or do you think that there was a truly good reason that they gave their lives? And you know, they thought there was. Every side, every but every person out there died for a reason. They were giving it all. Even though the Confederates may have been a little bit off on a different tangent, they uh, they had their reasons. And I'm sure only a very few of them actually fought for slavery. In fact, before the war even started, or actually before this battle ended, Longstreet had uh, said once to a friend, uh, we should have freed the slaves, then fired them or something. And that proves right there that a lot of the Confederates weren't fighting for slavery, that they're merely fighting for what they believe to be states, states' rights, which, which is the uh, U.S. history lesson. Yeah. <laughs> uh, every man out there died for a reason. They gave all, and they would have done it again, I'm sure, if the circumstances of the split the same. Any questions? of Gettysburg uh, should be, as I'm prophesizing, the biggest reenactment in history. Uh, ten years ago, the 1988 one was the biggest, and I think that in 19, uh, 1998 will surpass that. Yeah, I plan to go out next year, next summer. Angie, I could have sworn you was there when it happened. <laughs> I know, right? I think I finally understood it. <laughs> I never had a award. You know, your, your, your conception is that they're just out there, you know, that they're fighting, but... It was a planned thing, there was strategies that yes, were carried out and everything, yes. and just to, you know, have somebody that can explain that to you, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Show us your pain. Yeah, it's a the uh, painting that I did, uh, and that's why I have been here so little. Go to the art room. Yeah. <laughs> These are, this is what I've been slaving over. In fact, I stayed up to 11 with a lot in the last night. I had like one person on me. Really call it. But um, yeah, these all 
and you my paintings, and uh, I am donating them to Mr. Overson <laughs> for any future use. <laughs> could <laughs> you pass them around so we could see them, please? Yes, uh, you, <laughs> you can see my picture. <laughs>